Ah, it's finally spring. That felt like the longest winter ever. And no, that's not because global warming is fake. It's because the government is creating a Dyson sphere that is covering the sun little by little. Yeah, fun conspiracy theory to share over the dinner table. Speaking of the sun, and by extension, the Big Bang, we got a video here that attempts to discredit certain scientific theories. Freedom and God. I've done a few videos responding to them already, so this won't be anything new. Alright, roll the clip. The media often gives the impression that evolution is scientific because scientists can tell us how it happened. You know what's the greatest thing about science? Anyone can do it. As long as you know how to utilize the scientific method and have the time and equipment, anyone can become a scientist and try to figure out whatever they want. Don't believe something that scientists tell you? Go see for yourself. Don't believe in a certain experiment? Perform it yourself. It's time to stop seeing scientists as a group of people telling us facts and realize they're just regular individuals like you and me with a dose of curiosity. Of course, it does take a certain amount of studying and learning to get to the status of a scientist, so a bit of work is required, unfortunately. In reality, the supposedly factual accounts of where the universe came from and how the Earth's plant and animal life evolved are no more than imaginative stories. I always remembered in the past when I was younger and I asked for more clarity. Many people would get defensive when pressed for details. Who in the world would get defensive just from some kid asking about evolution? Sounds like you knew some weird people in the past. Let's begin with the Big Bang. According to Professor Brian Cox, you cannot claim that there wasn't a Big Bang because you can see it. Here, he is not referring to the Big Bang itself, obviously, but what he believes to be its afterglow, a background heat that fills the universe, a remnant of the original explosion. Yes, the cosmic microwave background. For those of you who don't know how this is proof of the Big Bang, allow me to briefly explain. It is the earliest and oldest electromagnetic radiation in the universe which came about during the Big Bang, and is composed the strongest of microwave radiation. If you have an instrument that is able to detect this low intensity radiation, you'll see that it's mostly uniform throughout, indicating that it doesn't belong to any specific star or celestial entity. When the universe first began, it started off as a hot dense singularity and expanded out. After a certain period of time, photons traveled freely in this universe, which eventually had its wavelength increased due to the expansion of space, and then primarily became microwaves over the course of billions of years. The even distribution of the cosmic radiation background, along with the certain variations of intensity, show that it came about through hot expanding matter, which concurs with our current understanding of the Big Bang. If you can come up with a model that explains the cosmic microwave background, then by all means go for it. But so far, no other person, or any physicist for that matter, has a better model than the Big Bang. What he doesn't let on, however, is that this afterglow, known as the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, is also a major problem for the theory. Explosions result in chaos, but the Cosmic Microwave Background is extremely smooth and even across the universe, the very opposite of what we would expect. Okay, so first of all, I don't particularly enjoy people calling the Big Bang an explosion, because that word comes with a lot of implications. Obviously, it suggests that chaos must arise from it, which isn't necessarily the case. I'd much rather call it an expansion of space, because that's what it was and that's what it still is. And yes, the uniformity of the cosmic microwave background was indeed a problem for many theoretical physicists. But like everything, there's a proper explanation. You're going to get to it in a bit, so let's wait until the topic comes up. Usually, a problem of this magnitude will cause people to doubt the theory and look for an alternative explanation. Well, you see, alternative explanations have already been explored, and none of them explain the cosmic microwave background as well as the Big Bang does. Some secular cosmologists came up with a solution which they called inflation. Their calculations indicated that the problem would go away if the expansion in the early stage was sped up. Well, actually sped up quite a lot. This is a little complicated and I'm not a physicist myself, so I'll try to condense this information to the best of my abilities. Yes, cosmic inflation is indeed the explanation given to explain the uniformity of the cosmic microwave background. But it's not that inflation was created only as a result of our observations of this background radiation, but rather the background radiation supports it. Anyway, inflation is here because the CMB would present a paradox with the timing of the universe expansion due to its uniformity, not because the Big Bang was some sort of explosion that should have created chaos. Cosmic inflation refers to a trillionth of a second in time in which which the universe, during its early stages, experienced an accelerated expansion rate. This makes it possible to speculate that the universe started off much smaller than originally thought, which would have given more time for radiation and heat to be evenly distributed like what we observe with the cosmic microwave background. Now, Mr. Freedom and God, let's see what your argument against that is. One of the early pioneers of inflation theory was Paul Steinhardt. Having worked on this for over 20 years, he admitted that it really has no scientific basis, relying on convenient and unprovable assumptions. 
Okay, you can't just say, well, look, this one particular physicist has a few problems with inflation, therefore inflation altogether is false. Not only is that an appeal to authority, it's also just lazy. You're not even telling us exactly why cosmic inflation is flawed. Okay, I'll explain a bit here myself. The inflation theory is largely accepted by the scientific community. However, there are a few physicists who don't accept it. Some say it presents a bigger problem of entropy in which before the inflation, the universe would have been even more ordered. Some say there simply just isn't enough evidence. Paul Steinhardt, the man you mentioned, is indeed one of the more vocal critics when it comes to cosmic inflation. He claims that inflation is unfalsifiable due to his nature to produce multiverses and therefore too flexible. However, despite a number of physicists opposing the idea of inflation, the majority of them do accept it. It explains many problems we are currently looking to solve, such as the uniformity of the cosmic microwave background and the flatness of the universe. Now, for the sake of argument, let's just assume inflation is wrong. Alright, in that case, we still have the cosmic microwave background telling us that the Big Bang happened. It may not explain everything about the Big Bang, and we wouldn't know the exact mechanism in which the uniformity of the radiation was produced, but it would still prove the Big Bang to have occurred. Nitpicking cosmic inflation will hardly bring you a step closer to intelligent design. Secular cosmologists have clearly not solved the problem and the Big Bang theory is still just as much a product of storytelling as it always have been. I gave you the benefit of the doubt and thought you might explain in your own words why inflation is false, but I guess my expectations were too high. The origin of life. In the 1950s, Harold Urey and Stanley Miller constructed some apparatus, which supposedly reproduced conditions present on the early Earth with a primitive atmosphere and water. Using sparks to simulate lightning strikes, they produced amino acids, some of the building blocks needed for life. According to the BBC, the Miller-Urey experiment supported the theory of a primordial soup. The idea that complex chemicals needed for living things to develop could be produced naturally on the early Earth. Yep, quite a famous experiment, I must say. And it's also noteworthy to mention this isn't the only experiment of this type. Many other scientists have done the same, except with updated conditions after more information was obtained about early Earth. In reality, they produced small amounts of less than half of the 20 different amino acid types needed for life, and none of the other necessary components. Okay, Miller himself reported that 11 of the essential amino acids were created from the experiment, which is more than half. A few scientists even went back and evaluated the experiment later and discovered, using higher technological separation methods, that more amino acids were actually produced than originally thought, up to 22. This, of course, was a modified version of the experiment, which I won't get into now. And the purpose of the experiment wasn't to prove that everything needed for life can be created in that condition, but rather it served as a proof of concept to suggest that it is possible to create organic amino acids from non-organic molecules. In in addition, other scientists have also done similar experiments and were able to produce even more amino acids, up to 25 different ones. They even started producing other essential compounds such as DNA and RNA nucleotides, alcohols, and aldehydes. I don't think it's fair to target the Miller-Urey experiment specifically without addressing these other works. In addition, the amino acids that were produced were an unsuitable mixture of left-handed and right-handed forms. Life requires these to be all like-handed. No one knows exactly why life on Earth is almost primarily composed of left-handed amino acids. That's a mystery we still need to solve, since it could have been either of the two enantiomers, or it could have been a 50-50 chance, who knows. Just because it has to be one or the other doesn't mean that producing a racemic mixture is detrimental compared to producing one of the two. What exactly is your point in bringing up the racemic mixture of the products? Hence the claim, as the BBC does, that the Yuri Miller experiment gives credence to the idea that natural processes can produce life from ordinary chemicals is absurd. Why is that absurd? Look at the claim. All it says is that certain compounds needed for life, such as amino acids, can be formed naturally in early Earth conditions. And that's exactly what the Miller-Urey experiment did. BBC even used the words supported the theory, which is much more humble than saying it's proof. It's like arguing that since natural processes might produce brick-like slabs, complex buildings with modern kitchens, fridges, microwave, ovens, and air conditioning systems could come into being without an intelligent designer. Look, we don't have the whole process of abiogenesis figured out yet, but that doesn't mean you can immediately jump to the claim that there's an intelligent designer, much less your version of God. But of course, I'm sure there are scientists out there who have already attempted to map out the processes in which abiogenesis has created life. And that thought process probably involves the idea that the first life forms were nothing like what we're familiar with. Perhaps they were just a puddle of RNA that was able to replicate. That would be considered life, would it not? According to one of the world's leading organic chemists, Professor James Tor says, Don't care. To argue that God created life is a positive argument that supports observational experience and is scientific in nature. Everything with information and complexity requires an intelligent designer. This is not a gap-based argument, but is scientifically supported through experience and observation in life. 
What exactly supports the idea of an intelligent designer anyway? I would love to get into the head of creationists and see why they think there's even any shred of evidence to support intelligent design. There is just simply none. If your religion is making you go out claiming that one of the most well-established scientific ideas out there is false, then there is something wrong with your belief system. Because at the end, science is the only reliable method we have to obtaining truth about the universe. Anyway, that's the end of this video. If you enjoyed this, be sure to leave a thumbs up and subscribe for more weekly content. Thank you so much to Fireshard, Daniel Seibel, and Shere Khan for being generous people. I'll see you all next week.